please give a big rock star welcome to this team of attorneys, the Freedom From Religion Foundation attorney team, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Buzz, that was really, really nice. It kind of makes me feel bad about sending all those passive aggressive emails about cleaning the office kitchen. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, these guys really are amazing and incredible to work with. Um, as you guys know, my name is Rebecca Markert. I'm the legal director. And I'm excited to be in Madison because if you come to our convention every year, you know that not everybody can go to every single convention. But when we're here in Madison, we're able to do that. So I'm gonna take a moment this morning to introduce the entire legal and strategic response teams to you and make them all come up here and wave. <laughs> so, um, Patrick Elliott is our senior counsel. He's part of the litigation team, Maddie Ziegler. <laughs> He's part of the, come on up here, everybody needs to see you. Um, and Chris Line, he is our newest attorney working on our intake team. He's also a photographer. And then Sam Grover is an associate counsel works on our litigation team. And then we have two new attorneys who have joined us as our legal fellows, Brendan Johnson and Dante Harutunian. And then we have our strategic response team headed by Andrew Seidel. And Ryan Jane is our staff attorney for strategic response. And we just hired a lobbyist this year working in Washington, D.C. is Mark Dan. And of course, nothing could get done without the help of our administrative team. So please welcome our legal assistant, Whitney Steffen. Um, Elizabeth Cavell is another attorney with our office, but she is unable to be here today because she is representing Freedom From Religion Foundation at a one-day conference in New York City called When Rights and Religion Collide. Um, but she's also a wonderful part of our team. Um, I don't know if we're doing a quick picture or if we're going to wait. Ingrid, are you taking a photo? Um, she's next on the next slide. <laughs> are you taking a photo, Ingrid, or are we good? Okay. okay. All right, good. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I also want to mention that we have an incredible team of interns every year. Um, this past summer, we had four law student interns, um, two from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, one from Marquette Law School, and one from Chicago Kent Law School. We also have undergraduate students who work with us, um, and they're pictured here. Mendel Jimenez was from Vassar College, and Eleanor Pressler is from University of Wisconsin at Madison. And she's here today, too. Come on up, Eleanor. So. <laughs> she was here this summer, and she's going to be working with us throughout the fall. And she's here at the convention to help sell you t-shirts and other things, too. <laughs> So as you know, um, our legal department and strategic response team advocates for state church separation in many different ways. These help keep the wall of separation between state and church secure. Um, the main avenue, avenues for this are through um, non-litigation and education advocacy, um, but then also litigation and um, contacting 
um, our elected officials um, doing all sorts of lobbying, what we like to call strategic response. Um, I am not going to talk a lot today because we have wonderful staff here and I want them to be able to talk to you because you guys see me all the time. So um, I'm going to invite Patrick Elliott and Maddie Ziegler up here to talk about our legal accomplishments. Um, and then Andrew and his team are gonna come up and talk about what strategic response has been up to for the last year. So before um, Patrick comes up here to discuss our litigation, I want to tell you that both he and Maddie graduated from the University of Wisconsin Law School and both have been with FFRF for the entirety of their legal careers. Their legal prowess and dedication to state church separation are second to none. So come on up. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and I'm gonna cover the litigation aspects and we have a, a little bit of an overview and we'll kind of talk about highlights from some of our cases. Um, and this is basically within the last year of uh, kind of how we've been operating. Uh, we filed one new lawsuit um, and generally, at any given time, FFRF probably has 15 lawsuits pending in the courts. Um, right now, we have 13 ongoing, and I'll be talking about some of the victories that we've had this year, which includes uh, three victories, uh, one of which is a closed case, and the other two that are, are still pending in, in the courts. Uh, besides our own cases, uh, one thing that I think is important that we work on are weighing in in the courts, filing an amicus brief or a friend of the court brief. And so we've, we've done a few of those this year that are, are, are in really important cases. Um, and one case you heard about last night uh, was a case before the Supreme Court where FFRF weighed in and on behalf of the plaintiffs in a challenge to a large public cross in a highway median in Bladensburg, Maryland. And uh, our brief argued, which may not be surprising to this audience, that a, a, large, a large Christian cross is an exclusionary religious symbol and even though that was a claimed war memorial, uh, it does not memorialize non-believers or non-Christians. And so filing these briefs uh, gives us an opportunity to present to the court arguments that the parties might not be fully presented. And I have an example of that, that Rebecca Markert actually uh, prepared and filed a brief this year in a California case uh, that was before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, which this is kind of a fun one because we're actually on the side of the government um, and that doesn't happen very often. Uh, so there, uh, the city of Albany um, had uh, basically, uh, was, was getting challenged by a group that said that they had the uh, right to maintain a cross on public property. Um, and so our brief uh, pointed out that uh, an easement uh, to maintain a cross is, is unconstitutional and is also unenforceable. And so that case is, has yet to be decided. Uh, one new case that we have not yet filed a brief on, but is an important case, and I know there's some Montana folks here. Um, so next month, FFRF will be filing a brief with other secular groups in a case before the Supreme Court um, in a case called Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. And uh, while the Montana Constitution prohibits aid to religious schools, the plaintiffs in that case are actually arguing that the federal constitution requires uh, that they receive vouchers for religious education. And so this case has a potential to impact not just Montana, but a number of states that have no aid clauses in their state constitutions. And so we will be weighing in on that. Uh, I did mention we filed one new case, and this is for, for the Wisconsin contingent. This is a Wisconsin case that we filed last November uh, we are challenging faith-based employee chaplaincy program created by was former Wisconsin Attorney General Brad Schimmel. Uh, so there were six men from Christian faiths, mo many conservative, who were formally appointed as Department of Justice chaplains. Uh, they receive uh, training and reimbursement at Wisconsin taxpayer expense. They are issued Department of Justice ID badges and building access card. And their explicit duties include providing spiritual guidance uh, to employees and their families. Um, so what we have pictured here is also a training session that the Department of Justice did for clergy serving as law enforcement chaplains. Uh, so with the help of a local attorney, Rich Bolton, FFRF filed suit uh, under both the US and Wisconsin constitutions. And this lawsuit points out that DOJ, Department of Justice employees are, are not in any way inhibited by their employment um, from freely expressing their religious beliefs they may have on certain things. Uh, but the program affirmatively excludes uh, secular mental health professionals. 
And because the chaplains are ordained clergy, this is both discriminatory and violates the both constitutions. So this case is still pending in district court and has just really begun. Uh, and I, the, the stuff that you're probably waiting for is to talk about some of our wins. Um, while 2019 has been a challenging year for protecting state church separation, we have had several legal victories. And uh, this slide features our local chapter, the Central Florida Free Thought Community, uh, and several FFRF members had challenged exclusionary rules for invocations at the Brevard County Commissioners. Um, so they were excluded from being able to deliver an invocation. Uh, Americans United, um, Rebecca Markert and Andrew Seidel and our staff and attorneys from the ACLU are rep representing the plaintiffs in this case. And so we won at the district court and then also this year we had an important decision by the Court of Appeals. And, I believe we actually uh, have a video clip to show a little bit of that. Well, Heather and Charles, it is business as usual here at the start of this meeting here tonight, but there is a chance that the way that they start these meetings could change based on that big blow they received from an appeals court yesterday about religious invocations. We think that the Brevard County Commission has spent far too much of the taxpayers' money fighting for religious bigotry. That needs to stop. Here at the Brevard County Commissioners' meetings. Can we just take a moment of silence, please? Silence continues to speak louder than words. The commission started doing moments of silence after the Freedom From Religion Foundation sued them for not being allowed to deliver invocations at their meetings. It's not that we're trying not to allow groups to speak. It's just that we call it an invocation. And when you invoke something, you're invoking usually a higher power. The Freedom From Religion Foundation represents those who don't believe in God or a higher power, but they've given invocations at other meetings, including the Orange County Commissioner's meeting just last week. And by the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, who said, the time is always right to do what is right. After years of litigation, an appeals judge ruled yesterday that Brevard County's procedure for selecting invocation speakers was, quote, discriminatory and unconstitutional, writing the commissioners may not categorically exclude from consideration speakers from a religion simply because they do not like the nature of its beliefs. We're thrilled that the, the uh, second court has affirmed the fact that this commission was discriminating unconstitutionally. The county has 21 days to appeal. The question is, will they? We're going to weigh our options. The Freedom From Religion Foundation says the only option is to stop the fight and allow everyone to take part in the invocation. If they bring back the invocations, would you guys be willing to go in there and do one? We would expect nothing less. <laughs> And so that was one, uh, you know, one of our victories from this year. And um, as Annie Laurie always says, we should win every case. Um, of course she is right, because the cases that we take are addressing actual violations of the Establishment Clause and, and what it prohibits, you know, abuse of government authority to advance religion. Uh, but 2019, as I mentioned, was a challenging year, in part because of the changing uh, federal courts and the, who, are the judge, who the judges are. And, but also because of the Supreme Court's ruling this year, finding that a long-standing cross in Bladensburg uh, was constitutional. So uh, I do have two cases to mention, two defeats that we actually won at the district court level, but then were subsequently overturned at the Court of Appeals. Uh, we have an image here of Dan and Annie Laurie, and one of our cases, which uh, you may know about because it's been going on for many years, was a challenge to the preferential housing allowance given to clergy that Dan and Annie Laurie weren't able to receive and that no other secular employees are able to receive. So here they're pictured with, uh, not surprisingly, the, the churches really want to keep this. So they filed a lot of briefs and paper in this case. And so we have Dan and Annie Laurie pictured with some of the filings in that case. Um, the Seventh Circuit ruled against FFRF this year in that challenge. Uh, the other case that uh, I wanted to mention is a challenge to the Lehigh County seal. Um, you may, something might be wrong with this. I don't know if you can tell. Um, <laughs> Uh, along with local counsel, uh, attorney Liz, Liz Cavell and our, and our staff argued that, uh, you know, this cross is representative on the symbol of government, and, and that was unconstitutional. Um, the Third Circuit in that case, relying on Bladensburg, ruled against us and found that because the seal was old, basically this was a permissible, this is a permissible seal. Um, so those are two of our, uh, you know, over, two cases that we had overturned this year, but we do have other uh, other wins. Um, this case was mentioned um, last night, and this is an actual um, 
an actual piece of the curriculum from a school curriculum in Mercer County, West Virginia, which had uh, Bible classes for their elementary school students and their middle school students. Part of that curriculum pushed, pushed creationism. And as you may have heard, uh, originally we had a defeat because it was ruled that our parent plaintiff didn't have standing because of the harassment that her family endured and because of the class she send, was sending her daughter to a neighboring school system. Uh, we had a great win, a resounding victory last December with the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals that said she does have standing in order to challenge this curriculum. And that's not the end of the story. Uh, the school district had appealed that to the U.S. Supreme Court. And while uh, that was for me personally both a, uh, and our team a professional accomplishment, it was also a personal accomplishment uh, for me because uh, the briefing uh, ended up being due the same week uh, that my son decided to come. So, uh, so we have Louie here, uh, and, and we also have a, a decision from the Supreme Court uh, de declining to take this case. Um, I just wanted to put a photo of, of Louie. <laughs> And the, the final case that I'll mention today is actually a free speech case. We are involved in, in a number of free speech challenges. Um, and you may be familiar with this as FFRF's Bill of Rights display. In 2015, uh, the Texas Governor Greg Abbott ordered this display to be removed from the state capitol, even though we had a permit uh, to put it up. Uh, we challenged that, and last year the district court uh, ruled in our favor that this was a violation of free speech. Um, the state had appealed that, in part arguing that, that when the district court declared that to be an unconstitutional practice, um, that he wasn't permitted to give that remedy to FFRF. Um, so our attorney, Sam Grover, who you've seen around the convention, argued that case earlier this month before the Fifth Circuit, and we're looking forward to a decision next year. Uh, so that covers the highlights from our litigation. Um, attorney Maddie Ziegler will provide uh, an update on our non-litigation work. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So as you know, FFRF primarily resolves disputes with letters of complaint or advice to you all who want to pursue matters on your own. So since last year's convention in San Francisco, we have achieved 239 non-litigation victories. Yeah, just by sending letters of complaint to government officials, uh, most of those involving religion in the public schools. Um, you can see a detailed summary of all of these victories at FFRF.org uh, or reported monthly in Free Thought Today. But I'd like to share some of our favorite cases from the last year with you now. We'll start off with one of the most common complaints we receive, which is prayer at high school football games. Last year, we learned that the Toombs County High School football coaches had brought in a pastor to pray with the athletes and that the coaches themselves were also preaching and praying with the students. Here's a short clip of what that looked like, There's sort of a call and response thing going on. But God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Coach Wilson. Hey, that's why we practice, practice what we do, guys. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. So we, we were sent this video, and uh, staff attorney Chris Line sent a letter to the school district and heard back from their attorney this February. Um, the attorney claims that the prayers were not authorized by the school, despite the video of them being led by school staff. But they did say that school staff and coaches had been directed not to lead or organize religious activity. Uh, here's, a, yeah, here's a coach prayer case that we handled this year. Um, I'll let the fine Fox 17 news team tell you about legal fellow Dante Harutunian's case in Rutherford County, Tennessee. In Tennessee, faith and football go hand in hand for a lot of people. So seeing a team praying out on the field before a game probably isn't that surprising. But in this case, the complaint is against who was leading that prayer. This video shows a moment of prayer for the Rockvale High School football team, led by coach Rick Rice before taking the field under Friday Night Lights this year. It's something a lot of people in the mid-state are used to seeing. We always prayed before games. That was just part of what we did. 
That's something that you see on the fields. That's something that you see in the locker rooms. That's something that you see in the classrooms, in small groups, when it comes to any athletic um, sport, but especially in football, we really see that. But this time, the video caught the attention of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. The group filed a complaint with the school against Coach Rice. In a statement to Fox 17 News, a representative states that courts have consistently ruled that public school teachers and coaches may not lead or participate in prayer with their students. A Rutherford County Schools representative confirms that prayers or religious activities have to be student-initiated and student-led. They say the Rockvale principal addressed the issue with Rice, who apologized for any misunderstanding, and everything has now been resolved. So we did have a good outcome there. Uh, this next one has unfortunately not yet been resolved, but we wanted to share it with you anyway. Um, the San Jacinto County Courthouse in Texas has large crosses displayed on all four sides of its building, uh, which they light up during the holidays. Uh, Staff Attorney Chris Lyon handled this one as well. We have a video of how that went. So here's what happened. A foundation called the Freedom From Religion Foundation, based in Wisconsin, says a longtime resident of Cold Spring complained to them about the crosses. And those we talked to have a hard time believing that. It's crazy stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't, um, I'm not really sure why they want them down. God doesn't force any of us to accept him. So what is that cross hurting? That cross isn't hurting anybody. No, I think it's wrong that they come up here to our little bitty town and want to come in here and boss us around. If you don't like it, go back to Washington, D.C. Usually they at least get it right and tell us to go back to Wisconsin, but that's what we're dealing with here. Um, but a cross complaint that we were able to resolve this year uh, was legal director Rebecca Markert's case in Finley River Park in Ozark, Missouri. The city had this massive cross uh, in the public park that it lit up during Christmas, uh, as you can see there. Uh, the city said that it would take the cross down initially, but the very same day as that announcement, it reversed course, uh, bowing to public pressure in the community. However, after a second FFRF letter from Rebecca, the city finally agreed to move the cross to public property, which it has now done. Private property, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Associate Counsel Elizabeth Caval handled this case in which Rockland Academy Charter Schools were sending students on field trips to Alliance Redwoods, a Christian camp with religious imagery posted around the property, like the sign you see, see here quoting the Bible. Uh, in response to our letter in January, an attorney for the schools reported that the school intended to move the camping trip to a secular location next year. Uh, in July of this year, the Scotland County, North Carolina Sheriff, Ralph Kersey, issued a new policy for the Sheriff's Department uh, by text message, uh, which read, in part, it will be prohibited for you to live with another while employed at the Scotland County Sheriff's Office unless you are officially married according to the law and word of God, uh, or related, essentially. Uh, so. Our new FFRF legal fellow, Brendan Johnson, wrote the county, pointing out that a policy limiting employees' behavior outside of work to that which the sheriff deems to be according to the law and word of God is unconstitutional. The sheriff claimed it was never an official policy, just a text he sent out to his employees, despite the text stating the policy was effective immediately. <laughs> but either way, the policy has been rescinded. The 2019 Appleton, Wisconsin North High School graduation included an inappropriate religious speech from Alvin Dupree, who is a member of the school board and also a pastor. He was introduced as Pastor Dupree at the graduation and led a prayer before asking all the Christian students in the audience to clap and repeat after him, for me, my source of strength is my faith and my relationship with Jesus Christ. Staff attorney Ryan Jane sent a letter. Uh, here's how that was resolved, plus some of Dupree's thoughts on the situation. 
The Appleton Area School District has implemented new procedures for reviewing graduation speeches after a member of the school board drew complaints over his references to his Christian faith. He made while speaking during the ceremony this past June at North High School. New Attend Jason Zimmerman spoke to both sides in what's now a debate over freedom of speech. This six-page document released by the Appleton Area School District highlights new requirements for those invited to give graduation speeches, such as prior review by the superintendent and forcing those who speak to sign an oath that they won't deviate from the script. School board member and pastor Alvin Dupree says the change comes in response to a reference he made to his Christian faith. As did the young lady who wore her Muslim attire, uh, that was her attire, and she made it clear that was who she was. Uh, as the principal who stood up and said that his source of strength is his spirituality, and I followed up right behind him and said my source of strength is my faith in Jesus Christ. While hundreds of students were in the audience, 29 did file a complaint over the reference, along with Madison-based Freedom From Religion Foundation. The organization says this is actually his third such complaint against Dupree. There's no doubt that he crossed the line with what he said. He was speaking on behalf of the Appleton School District, and he was he was using that opportunity to promote his personal religious beliefs, and that is clearly inappropriate. So, as I said in the beginning of the video, the district did implement a new, really good, strict policy to review speeches at future events, and we do not expect them to be inviting Reverend Dupree back. <clears throat> Uh, Council Sam Grover wrote a complaint letter to George County Schools in Mississippi after learning of signs posted on at least six school properties bearing a Christian cross and the words passion, purpose, pride, hashtag GC strong. Those words were chosen as the theme for the academic year, although the district denied that it had designed or approved of the signs tying that theme to Christianity. Uh, in a public statement, the superintendent hemmed and hawed about how FFRF had unjustly assumed that the signs bearing a Christian cross were meant to promote Christianity, uh, but the signs were hastily removed anyway. Uh, and we have a few more examples of religious displays in the public schools that we were able to get taken down. There was this plaque of the Ten Commandments at an Ohio school uh, that had been up since 1926 and was removed after we sent a letter. And the Desert Junior Senior High School in California painted over a Bible verse that had been displayed on a wall near the main office. Uh, the verse cited there begins, now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. So that was removed as you can see. Uh, there were multiple displays promoting religion in Saltillo Elementary School in Mississippi, including a cross hung above the door to an administrator's office and several other crosses posted in classrooms, a sign reading, Why Worry When You Can Pray, and this painting, which included a Bible quote, all of which we got taken down. Uh, as were these Bible quotes posted in a cafeteria in Bell Heron Middle School in Ohio, the helmet of salvation pictured there. Uh, and finally, Senior Counsel Patrick Elliott dealt with this sign at Wallace Rose Hill High School. The sign was located near the school's track and it displayed a list of religious themed action statements entitled the Bulldog Resolution. The first line of the sign recited the Bible verse, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And following the Bible verse are 12 statements, as you can see, nearly all of them are religious. Uh, and they include, I will be faithful to my team and coaches by honoring them and serving them as Jesus Christ did for me. And I will seek to honor God, be faithful to his church, obey his word, and do his will. And this, um, this September, this sign was removed. So... Yeah. So again, this is just a few of the over 200 victories we've had over the last year. Um, please do go on our website and uh, check out the full rundown. Um, and please also do keep uh, being our eyes and ears in your local communities and reporting these to us so we can handle them in the first place. Um, so that's all I have. Up next to talk about our strategic response team is our director of strategic response, Andrew Seidel.
Thank you. So the strategic response team just turned two years old. We have been fighting Christian nationalism our whole lives. SRT is sort of a mix between legal and communications and editorial and membership services. Uh, this year, we hired our first full-time lobbyist in Washington, D.C., our Director of Governmental Affairs, Mark Dan, and Ryan Jane is now a full-time SRT attorney. Also attached to the strategic response team are Annie Laurie, the communications team, especially Amit and Bailey, uh, and of course, the legal team. Uh, I'm the director of strategic response, and we basically do, well, we do a lot, but it's four basic categories of things. Uh, we work to shape public opinion with articles and editorials. We do lobbying, uh, including tracking, analyzing, and educating about pending legislation at the state level. We work to stop imminent violations before they occur with legal letters. I'm going to let Ryan talk to you about those two things. And then lobbying at the federal government level, which I'm going to let Mark talk to you about. Now, shaping public opinion involves wading into the news cycle to drive public debate on issues that FFRF cares about. Let's just take a look here. This Christian judge is a hero who ought to be celebrated and not condemned by these leftist groups that absolutely hate God and want to do nothing but sow division in this country. Uh, so that is Trump bootlicker, Robert Jeffress. Uh, he, he was mistaking spittle for counter argument. That he was on the Lou Dobbs show and he was talking about our complaint against the judge in the Amber, Gerger, Amber Geiger murder trial. That's a fun one. Um, Fox ran five news stories on this. Um, Trump actually tweeted out that clip. The complaint was covered nearly everywhere from CNN to NPR. The New York Times wrote two articles about it. The Washington Post did two stories about it. Uh, even outlets like the Daily Mail. So we were really shaping public debate and educating about state church separation. And if you happened to miss this complaint, this was the judge after Amber Geiger was found guilty of murder. Uh, the judge gave her a Bible, told her it was her job to read the Bible, read John 3, 316 with her, uh, told her, basically delivered a personal witness and proselytized to her while there were two armed guards standing right next to her. Shaping public opinion also involves getting our message out to, to you, to the members, but also to the public at large. And we do this with FFRF statements, with op-eds, and articles. Uh, we drafted nearly 40 statements for FFRF on a variety of issues this year, from Trump tweeting about Bible classes, to the terror attacks in New Zealand, to our support for the Equality Act. Now, these often require speed, and SRT regular, regularly gets drafts to our communications team in less than an hour. Uh, we also did 53 different press releases for FFRF on legal and legislative issues. And then we did another 55 articles, op-eds, and blogs uh, on a whole different bunch of outlets. I mean, Rewire News, Slate, other outlets. I did a three-part series for Rewire on In God We Trust, where we looked at the his history of that phrase and how it became our uh, national motto. Uh, legality of the phrase and why it is right why you're seeing it right now it's not an accident that you're seeing these display laws in every state it's part of a coordinated Christian nationalist push called Project Blitz uh, and right now I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan our SRT attorney to talk about the state level lobbying work and our rapid response work Ryan So a big part of what the strategic response team does is herding the cats. Or, excuse me, what I should say is mobilizing godless and secular Americans. <laughs> Since the last convention, you've made more than 100,000 connections with legislators on the 77 action alerts that we've sent out. That's amazing. And that total number is actually much higher. Uh, thank you. Yeah, give, give yourself a round of applause. I think it's incredible. And the total number is actually a lot higher. Those are only connections to federal legislators using our system. Uh, that number does not include connections to state 
legislators, which we currently cannot uh, track. It does not include personal connections, uh, any connections through social media, shares on social media, or connections made as a result of those shares are, uh, are not included there. Part of lobbying is also tracking legislation. Uh, this year, FFRF tracked 447 bills, and 60% of those, nearly two-thirds, were negative. Much of the legislation that we opposed did not end up passing, uh, including some of the worst. We stopped private school voucher type schemes in eight different states. We stopped a bill to make the Bible the official state book of Mississippi. <laughs> We stopped the so-called Live and Let Live Act in Colorado, which would have allowed anti-gay religious discrimination in the state. And then we also stopped a Florida bill that would have required public high schools to offer for credit uh, Bible class. And that Florida bill was actually just recently reintroduced by State Representative Kim Daniels, and we look forward to defeating her again. Uh, most notably, we tracked and opposed bills pushed by Project Blitz, as Andrew mentioned. This is a scheme that's aimed at codifying Christian nationalism uh, that features a wide variety of bad bills, uh, including displaying In God We Trust in public schools. And we made this graphic to show the sudden recent spread of these laws. So you can see as it hits 2018 and 19, there's just this sudden explosion. Now, it's no secret that the Trump administration has been trying to cram as many religiously conservative judges into the federal, federal judiciary as they can. And the strategic response team, with your help, has opposed judicial nominees who are particularly bad on state church issues. We also did what we could to stop Attorney General William Barr. Uh, you all heard yesterday about his speech last week at Notre Dame, where he said awful things about secular Americans. Uh, here's another taste of some of the things he said. Uh, he said, Judeo-Christian moral standards are the ultimate utilitarian rules for human conduct. And among the militant secularists are many so-called progressives, but where is the progress? And then no secular creed, he said, has emerged capable of performing the role of religion. And there was much more in that vein, blaming secularism for quite literally everything that's going on. Uh, some media outlets seemed surprised at these remarks last week, but we actually sounded the alarm about this when he was first nominated. We unearthed speeches that Barr gave in 1992 that, where he said nearly identical things. Uh, SRT spearheaded an effort to educate senators about Barr's bigotry and his Christian nationalism, and we wrote a letter that many other secular groups signed on to, including the Secular Coalition of America, American Atheists, and Center for Inquiry. We also warned uh, everyone about Mike Pompeo. He's got a similarly awful Christian nationalist past, and uh, as was also mentioned yesterday, when he spoke last week, he used the Department of State to promote his Christian nationalist version of leadership. Uh, again, this was the image of the official US government website for the Department of State. SRT drafted a letter of complaint immediately upon learning of this, and uh, within a few hours, this image was down from the website. Thank you. And the last thing I'm going to talk about briefly is the we work with the legal team to address complaints that require immediate action, rapid response. Uh, we got a complaint that the town of Charleston, Illinois, was organizing trips to Ken Ham's uh, Ark Encounter and Creation Museum. So I wrote a letter to the town the same day. This trip was just about to come up and was able to get those trips canceled. And that also got FFRF some favorable media attention. As you can see, this is the Christian Post covering us, giving us credit for stopping those trips. And then Andrew and I followed that up with a mass mailing to every single school district anywhere near the Ark Park, spanning across five different states, to remind them that it's unconstitutional for public schools to organize similar trips. We also wrote, to, wrote an emergency letter to Morgan County Schools in Alabama after receiving a report that they were partnering with a private Bible college 
to offer a Bible class to public high school students. We got a letter to the school district within an hour, and that really flipped the script of the, uh, the media coverage. The Bible college was suddenly on the defensive, and in trying to explain themselves, they actually put their foot in their mouth even more. And after that, as far as we know, the school has not gone forward with that class. So we're very proud of that. And since, thank you. And since this is Alabama, guess who wrote in to defend the Bible class? That's right, uh, disgraced judge and failed Senate candidate Roy Moore also weighed in and made a fool of himself as usual. It's always fun to chalk up another victory against Roy Moore. So with that, I will turn it over to the newest member of the strategic response team, Mark Dan. Thank you, good morning. Okay, so we've had a tremendous year in the government re relations program. We've been bringing FFRF supporters uh, into Congress, building close relationships with members, and breaking the Christian nationalist grip on our government. This year, we've had three members of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus appear on FFRF's TV show, Free Thought Matters. And as you know, uh, the Congressional Free Thought Caucus supports the separation of church and state, reason and science and policy making, and the equal treatment of free thinkers. You don't have to be a non-believer to join the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. It's open to all members regardless of faith. And we've had the two caucus co-chairs on the show, Representatives uh, Huffman and Raskin, and of course our hometown Congressman Mark Bocan. This feat was unthinkable a few months ago, and a big thank you to Bruce Johnson, who is our TV guru for making the members' uh, TV appearances happen. I don't know how he did it, but he bounced the signal coming from the house studios to a rented satellite truck into our studios that many of you saw um, at the open house. So Bruce, thank you so much for all of your effort. And then when Congressman Huffman appeared on the show, he quickly diagnosed one of the main problems in Congress. Um, we're constantly invited to make policy based on things other than science and reason and facts. Uh, climate change is, you know, maybe the greatest example of this. Honestly, this is no exaggeration. I have colleagues across the aisle who just can't get their head around why we would make policy based on future generations to come when, you know, the rapture is probably just around the corner. They literally think that way and they talk that way. Uh, pretty scary stuff. Uh, you see it in foreign policy all the time. Uh, to some extent, the fervent militaristic support of Israel, um, the constant push for war in the Middle East. Uh, some of my colleagues advance these ideas because they want to bring on the end of days and, and you know, that great glorious uh, Armageddon that will hasten the coming of the Messiah. This is dangerous, crazy stuff, and it belongs nowhere in our public policy. Not surprisingly, our uh, neighbors in the right-wing media from Fox News and the Washington Examiner quickly leapt on that story. Uh, Liz Cheney jumped on it, and you responded, and I cannot thank you enough for that. FFRF supporters sent over 500 original letters to Representative Huffman's office. And it is critical that our friends and allies on the Hill know that we have their back. We've heard it so many times that we hear from the opposition, but we don't hear from you. Well, thanks to you, you are changing that. And of course, um, on the team FFRF, I want to thank uh, James, Lauren, and Bailey for helping to organize all of those letters and get them to Representative Huffman. So thank you so much on that uh, team effort. And of course, we've also been racking up legislated victories. In divided government, that is difficult to do. And one of our key legislative objectives is making sure all Americans have access to a secular recovery option, which is a constitutional right. Religious 12-step programs are widely available and often the default treatment program, especially for people in the criminal justice system, and we're changing that. 
Pending passage, we got an insertion into the budget that empowers federal agencies to work with mutual support recovery organizations that support medication-assisted treatment. And that is going to enable so many more options for people who are seeking more recovery options. And getting an insertion into the budget is extremely difficult. It takes a lot of shoe leather campaigning, and we've got excellent partners with other secular members, whether it's CFI, American Atheists, and of course our friends in the Secular Coalition for America, here uh, represented by Debbie Allen, so, uh, what, and wonderful partners within the recovery community, whether it's smart recovery or re life ring secular recovery options. And we can't stand up to Christian nationalists on our own. We need allies in DC, and we're building that through our legislative efforts. Two of our major legislative efforts are through the Do No Harm Act and the Scientific Integrity Act. The Do No Harm Act, which bans religious exemptions and laws guaranteeing fundamental civil and legal rights. We've been working with the ACLU, Interfaith Alliance, Human Rights Campaign, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Through our lobbying and working with allies, we've added 37 new co-sponsors on the Do No Harm Bill. This, there were six this week alone um, who have co-sponsored uh, co the Do No Harm Act. And I especially want to thank Rachel Lazar, uh, who you heard from, and our crew from Americans United uh, for being such wonderful partners. Another key bill is the Scientific Integrity Act, uh, which bans political meddling in publicly funded scientific inquiry. It has been voted out of committee and it is going to the health House floor. And when people say, oh, elections don't matter, well, the progress on these bills were not happening before the 2018 elections. Thanks to pro-secular majorities in the House, you are making those progress, you're making that progress available. So that is a huge, huge accomplishment that we can start playing offensive ball instead of being in a purely defensive crouch. And to advance these bills, it takes a lot of labor. I want to thank my ever-present member uh, partners on the Hill with Katie Josephs from Interfaith Reliance, uh, Roger from Black Nonbelievers, Yasin Naji from Ex-Muslims of North America, and of course, I want to thank my go-to FFRF person on the Hill, Barbara Stocker, who is here with us today uh, and is always ready to tell her story and share it with lawmakers. So thank you, Barbara, for all of your support, and thank you so And thank you so many of you for doing all that you can, whether it is calling your lawmaker, getting to know them, visiting, donating a little bit of money. Um, all of this takes resources, and I can't thank you enough for your time, your presence, your energy, and at this conference, your great sense of humor. So thank you. And Andrew. Uh, so this is just a sample of what the strategic response team does. We actually handled more than 500 separate projects this year. A lot of those you're never going to get to hear about. Uh, lobbying by its nature, there's a lot of behind the scenes things. So our influence is a little greater than even this suggests, but there's a lot that we can't publicly claim credit for. Uh, but SRT and FFRF Legal are here and we are fighting for you. We will always be fighting for you. And with that, we are going to take some questions. I know this is everybody's favorite part. If you've got questions, please go to the microphones to ask them. Please, if you've got a state church complaint, please do not ask it as a question. Please see us afterwards. If you've got a personal story you'd love to tell, we want to hear it. But please reserve this time for questions. And you were up first. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ginger from Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And I'm just wondering, how do you get notified of things like the, the website going up so rapidly? Well, so that, that's part of our job at the strategic response team is to be dialed in, having a finger on the pulse. Uh, it involves uh, being on social media, being tapped into the right reporters uh, who see these things, and having people like you willing to get it to us very, very quickly. Do you want to talk about the regular intake form, too, because they come through that? 
Yeah, we also um, hear from you guys. Um, you will contact um, our intake team through our web form to let us know that something is happening, um, and we can jump on those pretty rapidly as well. This is not for midgets, oh, here we go. Oh, uh, oh we're gonna go into this side first. Hi, um, I, I, don't know, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I've noticed you say state church separation. <laughs> Language is really important to me. I, could you speak on that versus separation of church and state? Yeah, Annie Laurie drums it into us on the first day. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't even realize I did that until a reporter pointed it out. He's like, I like what you did there. And I was like, what did I do there? I don't know. Hey, we, we, do, we do do it deliberately. It is deliberate because it flips the script and state is far more important and the church does a lot more. Uh, but it also, when people hear that, you, you recognized it, the reporter recognized it, it lands in a different way and it actually makes people stop and think instead of being able to disengage their brain with a familiar phrase. <laughs> I have a question about Mark, who is delightful, by the way. <laughs> Not necessarily to him, but about him. <laughs> I thought that you can't lie. We're going to lose our no, yeah. status a because of Mark. It's a good question. Because he's lobbying. Yes, it's a good question. You, all nonprofits are allowed to do a small amount of lobbying dependent on their budget, and we're not anywhere close to that. We would not compromise our, our tax exempt status with that. Right, right. We have what's called the H election, which allows us to use 20% of our budget towards lobbying efforts. Uh, my question is uh, voting places. Uh, the voting place where I vote, I'm from Addison, Wisconsin, has been changed from a school because of access for people that are handicapped and so forth to a church. Is that legal since there's no other place in the district that is a public place to be where people can vote? So yes, this is a complaint we receive fairly commonly, um, especially around election times. And unfortunately, two courts in the country that have spoken on this issue have found it to be permissible. Um, and that's because there are other ways to vote. You can early vote, you can mm -hmm. do absentee voting. Um, and so they seem that they've deemed that to be permissible. Um, we still file letters of complaint, though, on those. Um, we'll write to the government entity that is in charge of selecting polling places and tell them that it's inappropriate um, and point out that there are people who don't want to go to a house of worship, any house of worship, to um, exercise their civic duties. Um, it's not always successful, but um, it definitely puts our voice in that there should be secular locations for people to vote in. Um, and there are a lot of people who get really upset about it. Um, I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, um, Florida, uh, it was a city in Florida that got in trouble because they were, <laughs> they were selecting mosques and everybody was outraged that they had to go there to vote. And we were like, yeah, we've been saying that. Um, people don't like to go to houses of worship. <laughs> um, but really, what it takes to stop that is um, citizens contacting those boards and letting them know that they want to go to secular locations in order to vote. Yeah, and you, you should do that. Patrick has done that personally and been successful. And if you have other questions like that about you know, what is legal and what is not, there's a great section on our website that's full of all kinds of legal FAQs, and that one is covered on there with a bunch of others too, and we're regularly updating those, so that's a great place to find information if you're not at a conference and able to ask us a question right now. You can just jump on the website. And we, oh, go ahead. This is Bill Shackleford, a member from uh, Des Moines, Iowa. I have a question about uh, how you're gonna approach the arguments that I hear. I read about 100 pages of the transcript of a Supreme Court case that we lost about the cross in Maryland. And one of the most effective arguments seemed to be, they're starting to be very assertive, I've read this also in Wall Street Journal, about groups like FFRF are not just an irritant, but they're trying to rewrite history. That was, seemed to be an effective part of that argument. They're trying to obliterate the mom markers of history and rewrite it as though Jesus, Christianity never existed. How do you respond to that accusation? 
<laughs> so you're talking about the Bladensburg cross case. Mm -hmm. uh, for a quick refresher for everybody, this is the 40-foot tall concrete cross just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld that cross this year, largely, they said, because, look, it's basically, it's been there for a long time, you guys. Um, that was essentially what they did. And what, what the court did, what Alito's opinion in particular did, was elevated history above legal principle. And the history that he chose was bad. It was flawed. Uh, and this is, I have a law review article coming out on this shortly. But he also, he said things, for instance, like, look, when they put up the cross 90 years ago, we don't really know what they were thinking, you guys. We could never know. It was 90 years ago. But 230 years ago, when the founders wrote the First Amendment, we know exactly what they were thinking, and they thought this would be fine. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it, there's, there's a ridiculous inherent contradiction at the heart of that opinion. The good news is it is a, it is a very, very bad opinion. There's very, there's very little good law in there. So I don't think it's going to stand, but I don't know when we're going to get it knocked down. Not and, the cross, the opinion. And what we're doing um, at FFRF is um, we've been repositioning ourselves um, in light of the changing federal mm -hmm. bench, which is now 30% Trump appointees um, and a hostile Supreme Court, as evidenced by the, the Bladensburg decision and other decisions that have come down in the last couple of years. Um, so we're really looking at um, trying to educate the public about state church separation and why it's an important right that people should be prepared to defend. Um, but we also want to educate the future generations of attorneys and lawyers that are coming up um, so that they know that this is bad history. Um, to that end, um, Andrew and I have been working for the last year to put on a legal symposium at Roger Williams University School of Law, which will invite six legal scholars and historians Seven, I'm sorry, <laughs> legal <laughs> scholars and historians to come and talk about the topic, is this a Christian nation, and how bad history has been influencing bad court decisions. Um, that's going to happen next spring, and it's really important because when you're a lawyer, um, a young lawyer in particular, or you're clerking for a judge, and you need to learn about a topic, Generally, you go to what's called secondary sources, and these secondary sources um, are law review articles and journals and things like legal symposia. And a symposium is a, the most comprehensive treatise on a topic. Um, and so when we do this and publish this journal on state church separation is America a Christian nation, that's going to be incredibly valuable to the next generation of lawyers and judges. Um, and so we're trying to flip the script there and tell them what the history was. Yeah, I mean, it, it addresses directly that point. It's right on the history. It's... That was over there, so I think we're over here now. Nick, Nick Sheridan from Baltimore, Maryland. And I was recently in Alabama and saw license plates with God bless America on them, and I'm assuming that you've tried to deal with this, but I'd like to know why they're allowed to still have those, those license tags. Well, unfortunately, it's our national motto, and it has been deemed not religious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, God okay. bless America, yeah. Okay. Well, so th there's also, with license plates, there's... Um, you can get in and get a, get a license, get the state to make a license plate for you, for your group or your nonprofit, and this has been permitted. Um, actually, there's Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, um, which brought the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. They're the anti-FFRF. Um, <laughs> they have the In God We Trust license plates in Arizona, and a portion of the fees from those license plates actually ends up going to support their hate and bigotry. Um, so it, it is something that we have been working on for a long time. Um, there's a lot of free speech issues tied up in it. Uh, we've also got a case going in Kentucky with the ACLU of Kentucky right now, which is slightly related, uh, which is uh, they have In God We Trust license plates there. And one of our members wanted a vanity plate that said, I am God. <laughs> <laughs> and Patrick, what was, the, what was the denial? What was the reason for the denial? Yeah, it was in bad taste and not decent. That was why they denied it. 
Um, so we, we're suing over that one right now, and that one is looking hopeful. So there's a lot of other not just state church issues tied up in that, but open forum and free speech type issues. And really, every state is different when, the, when you come down to the legal analysis, unfortunately. Jeez, I was just about to say, I am God. So that blew it for me, but no. Um, what an incredibly impressive team you have. Uh, it just really makes me so proud to be a member. Thank you. Just a, uh, a general legal question. The amicus briefs that you file, what kind of impact do they have? Yeah, that's, a, that's a big question in the legal field, actually. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, for them to have the biggest impact, they really have to give the court something special to consider, something that they might not necessarily be thinking of when they are looking at a case. Um, if you don't know what an amicus brief is, it's a front of the court brief. So it's a brief filed by um, an outside organization that's not party to the litigation. Um, but they do offer something um, that the court should um, here, either a perspective or an argument that the court might not be thinking about. Um, and we think that our amicus briefs have a lot of impact because they're not thinking about non-religious Americans a lot, especially in things like the Bladensburg Cross case when we're talking about veterans being memorialized. Well, there are a lot of veterans who do not believe in God, and so we want that voice to be brought before the court. Um, so. I like to think that they have a lot of impact, but a lot of times when they are these high profile cases, especially a culture war case, um, the court is um, really like given a lot of amicus briefs. There will be 30 or 40 on one particular side, but really to stand out, you have to have some sort of special argument. Yeah, I mean, to give you an example, in the Hobby Lobby case back in 2015, uh, we filed a brief in that case. Marcy Hamilton wrote the FFRF brief, and there was, I think there was 80 different amicus briefs cited, but uh, the media covered ours. So I think it, do, I think it does have an And impact. why did they cover that one, Andrew? Because we argued, that the <laughs> whole, we argued that the whole law was unconstitutional, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was unconstitutional, rather than just saying this, sh this exemption shouldn't be allowed. So we, we stuck out F FFRF's position, which is the right position, and uh, <laughs> the, I mean, that is what garnered the attention. So I think it does have an impact. And it also shifts the Overton window, if anybody knows what that is. So we can skip that. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Chris from Missouri. Uh, I'm retired military, so that's going to color my comments real quick. Uh, the reason I joined the FFRF is because this is the arm of the secular movement that is the most aggressive. This is a war. It's a war for our future, war for our culture. And the reason I specifically became a life member of FFRF is because you're aggressive and you're getting things done. I want to thank you all very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to say that uh, if under God we, if in God we trust is not secular, then what if we put Satan in place of God? I would ask that question. Um, it's a great point, and that's what we were getting at with the billboard. Thank you. Chucky. Yeah. So, um, you know, retired military, um, we, we want to understand the enemy. So for all of us to understand how the enemy thinks and what they're doing is very important. You all are doing that strategically and tactically. One of the questions I want to ask is, um, locally I'm trying to run for school board. I haven't been successful because people don't want to hear the things that I say about <laughs> wanting to increase the quality of education. So that's a way to get this, this system going and to put uh, reason and common sense in, in, in this equation, this debate. So school boards are one way. Running for political office at the local level is another way. Um, the lobbying is a great way to do business. What you all are doing, the legal business is great, but that presence is also important. So what I'm kind of asking for is, is there a way to have a sort of a consolidated uh, place, either on, on the FFRF website or someplace, where all of us collectively and all of our people that we know can have a reference? In other words, if you want to make a movement uh, happen, if you want to be part of the action, here's things you can do. And a side question to that to our lobbyists, sir, is I have been told, and I've, I've burned up my phones calling the local, the state, and the federal offices trying to get things done. I've been told that calls are much more effective than uh, letters and emails. So in order to maximize our yeah. effectiveness and efficiency, yeah. I would just ask if there's anything for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree. As a former congressional staffer, nothing ruined my day more than calls. Um, <laughs> um, when, when I was working on the Hill, eons ago, what feels like eons ago now, um, is when Ilian Gonzalez, if you remember him, um, uh, was came to the country and everybody was calling um, 
the senator to say, like, you know, send them back, keep them here, send them back, keep them here. Um, and we got so many calls that our senior staff had to come out and relieve our junior staff. And when that happens, when the call, when your lines are so tied up that you have your policy director answering the phone and talking to some constituent from AMRA, Wisconsin, um, the senator notices that and there's definitely a memo about it. So calls are really, really effective. So I would like to talk to you afterwards about your, your other idea. I, wanted, I do want to touch on running for office. This is something in the, the book tour that I've been doing that I've been encouraging everybody to do at the, at the end. I think it is something that everybody in this room is absolutely capable of. And I know some of you are out there thinking right now, like, well, I don't have any experience. I don't know the first thing about running. I mean, what would I do? Like, look at the people who are in office right now. <laughs> I mean, you can definitely do it. I would really encourage everybody to do that. It is one of the most effective things that you can do. And I think Hemant's showing that there's a wave coming that people aren't expecting. And I'd love for our people to be a big part of that. Uh, David Jorling from Portland, Oregon. Um, on the uh, Bar Attorney General Barr's speech to Notre Dame, is any uh, uh, pushback planned uh, with Notre Dame, like asking for equal time or writing an article in the student newspaper uh, that <laughs> might... Notre Dame is a private Catholic university. Yeah, so I, gonna, I, uh, I understand that. They're going to pound sand on that. Yeah, I, I, they can uh, do pr pretty much whatever they want, but yeah. just if, if, if an effort was considered to, to do that sort of thing. No, I mean, so the strategic, it is on the strategic response team's to-do list after convention recovery, um, <laughs> dealing a little more sharply with both Pompeo and Bill Barr. Uh, and we do have a few thing, a few options on that. So you're, just, you're gonna have to stay tuned for more on that. But trying to get Notre Dame to do, do something uh, equal time is gonna, I mean, I mean, we could ask, but. Well, if you know any students there, tell yeah. them to do something. Yeah, that'd be the, be that'd be the good <laughs> way to do it, have the students try to organize a counter thing. Hi, I'm Tom Waddell, president of the Maine chapter. Hey, and uh, yesterday there was some talk or discussion about <clears throat> uh, a uh, school that was having prayer in school. And uh, one student had to leave his classroom. I, I don't remember all the details now, but one student had to leave his classroom. So that's being that's litigated. Right. I think you're talking about Mercer County. You're actually, Patrick t just touched on it. That was the the case where they were teaching Bible classes in school. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. that was Patrick, because I was gonna ask him uh, about this, but I thought I'd do it now. So my question is, why does that have to be litigated now when Vashti McCollum uh, got her answer 30 or maybe 40 years ago? Well, it's, it's not prayers, it was Bible classes. And the, okay. reason, the reason that it, it still happens is because courts have said Bible classes in the public schools can be done in a constitutional way. Like kids should learn about the Bible. The line is you can teach about the Bible, you can't preach the Bible. You can educate, but you can't indoctrinate. Wow. Okay. Uh, and so what we were seeing in that class where kids are, hey, picture Adam and Eve sliding down a dinosaur's back. Like that is way past the line uh, into complete indoctrination. Um, so that, that, was, that was the issue here. But it, what we, weren't even, we haven't even gotten to the merits yet in that case. We're still fighting over whether or not our parent can even bring the case, except that's what we just want. All right, and earlier you talked about separation of church and state, and I was wondering if there's any value in changing that to separation of religion and government. We do do that too. Um, Annie Laurie often puts that in um, letters that we write as well. All right, thank you. Over right here? Uh, yeah, we only I'm, have a few more minutes, so. Sorry. That's I'm Barb right. Hazlett. I'm from um, Port Charlotte, Florida. I substitute teach in the Florida public schools, and every day I walk into a school, I am assaulted by, in God we trust, prominently displayed in every school office. Mm -hmm. You kind of half answered my question when you mentioned that it's the motto, our U.S. motto. Uh, and this was... Um, introduced by a Democratic legislator Kim in Daniels. Florida. Yeah. Huh? Kim Daniels. Yes. And I, first of all, I'm wondering, so there's nothing being done about this, evidently, because it's our U.S. motto. But what bothers me the most is in, can't we maybe 
attack it from that point yeah, of view. Yeah, well, there's is not nothing. There's not nothing being done about this. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know about Kim Daniels, she's a legislator in Florida. She speaks in tongues. She thanked God for slavery because otherwise she'd be worshiping a tree in Africa. She once saw Predator from the movie Predator in her hotel room. It was a demon. It was a demon. Don't worry. Um, she passed, she proposed this law and we had successfully battled it down and fought it down. And then Parkland happened. And instead of passing something valuable, the Florida legislature decided to latch on to her dead bill and pass that as their measure to prevent a second Parkland from happening. They did it in front of those kids, if you remember the protests. Um, we are looking for ways to challenge and get one of these display laws struck down. Uh, and we'd certainly be happy to chat with you as a teacher in the public schools about that okay. more. Especially because it is in the public school context, um, the courts are still very, very protective about religion in the public schools. And so that is an area that we would keep fighting against those displays. So that's, that's gonna do it for us. If you have more questions, we are all here all day. Please come find us. We are happy to chat more. If you've got complaints, we're happy to take those too. Thank you. Thank you.